Fox Energy Efficient Home, a series of presentations designed to show homeowners like yourself how to make your home more environmentally responsible, energy efficient, and save money. My name is Michael Murphy. This is Building Blocks Energy Efficient Home, and welcome to Marinex Self Storage Studios, which is coincidentally a 10 by 30 storage unit. Now, today's presentation is on the topic of building science and weatherization. And we have a special guest today, our favorite town supervisor, Nancy Seligson. <laughs> Hello, Nancy. Hi, Michael. I'm very happy to be here and uh, participate in the Building Blocks Terrific. Energy Program. Great. Well, do you have a few words to the audience? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am the town supervisor for the town of Marinette. And I am happy to participate in this because building a more resilient, sustainable, and energy-saving Mamaroneck is really important to us as well. And this is part of it because it's not just the government effort, but we need your effort as well. We need the residents and people to participate as well. We have created a sustainability collaborative in the town of Mamaroneck, which is our environment committee. And they have helped us do some amazing things in the town of Marinette that are saving us money, number one, reducing our energy costs, which is fantastic, but also reducing our energy footprint, our carbon footprint, and we're using less energy. Some of the things we've done are very, very simple, what you would call low-hanging fruit. We've closed the town center two nights a week and asked everyone to consolidate all the meetings on uh, Wednesdays and Mondays and everyone's been able to do that so we're able to turn down the building which is a large energy user two nights a week and that saved us a lot of money. We have uh, done some fun things like we have converted two garbage trucks to run on used vegetable oil so we collect the used vegetable oil from our local restaurants we filter it and uh, clean it so that it's able to be used in a garbage truck and vegetable oil runs much, much cleaner than diesel fuel does. And the good thing is that instead of smelling like garbage, the garbage trucks smell like french fries or Chinese food. We're not sure if that's good for your appetite, though. Um, we also have done some very important and big projects. Uh, the biggest one, I would say, is doing an energy performance contract. And that is uh, working with a contractor, and in this case it was Honeywell, to upgrade and renovate all the major buildings in the town of Mamaroneck to make them more energy efficient. The town center, the ice rink, which is the largest energy user in the town, the firehouse, and we changed all of the street lights to LED lights. The beauty of this project is that the energy savings from those improvements, especially the lighting, actually covers the bulk of the cost of the principal and interest payments for the renovation. And these renovations had to be done no matter what on the buildings because the ice rink and the town center were desperately uh, in need of repair and update. So we're very proud about that and we're going to be able to give exact numbers of how much money we're saving each year through, those, through that specific project. We also, uh, with the town, uh, the village of Mamaroneck and with the village of Larchmont, participated in the Solarize program. And we were a top producer in getting uh, residents to sign up for solar power, which is fantastic because that's going to reduce uh, our collective uh, energy use in our community. And along with the village of Mamaroneck, that was sponsored by uh, Murphy Brothers. The town of Mamaroneck also uh, was awarded a grant to study the feasibility of creating a microgrid, which is an alternate source of power for a specific area that could be based on renewable energy and also will provide power in the event that the grid goes down. And we know from Superstorm Sandy that a major concern of our residents is power continuity and we're working on that. So we're very excited about that as well. And we have a lot of other programs and projects that we're working on in the town to try and save money, reduce our energy use, reduce our energy cost, reduce our carbon footprint, and help the community, the region, and even the country get to a better place in, in energy. Because without a comprehensive plan, 
helping us on a national or world level, which I know everyone is working on. It really is up to the local municipalities and the individual residents to collectively come together and take efforts, make efforts that together will make a big difference. So I applaud uh, Murphy Brothers for bringing this information uh, to you. And if you're interested in participating or helping the town of Mamaroneck save money and reduce energy, please contact my office and we would love to have you help us. And now I get to introduce Chris Puglia, who you. is uh, going to talk to us about building science and weatherization. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much. I also am very happy to be part of this, uh, the ongoing efforts by Michael Murphy, the town of Mamaroneck, Murphy Brothers Contracting. Uh, it's a great idea and it's something that everybody can do to sort of chip away at all the things that Nancy was discussing. Um, and I'm sure most of you have the concept of changing a light bulb to a more energy efficient light bulb. And even though that light bulb costs more, the savings and the durability and the longevity create a positive return on investment. Um, solar, wind, geothermal heating, weatherization, insulation, there's all kinds of things that we can do to reduce our carbon footprint and reduce our energy consumption. My goal here with this presentation is to sort of give you the background. Where does this all come from? Where does it start? What's the idea behind it? Um, and quite simply, it'll be a friendly um, mini science lesson. I explain to people that it is not rocket science, but it is building science. And there are a few things to take into consideration. So with the presentation, Energy efficiency obviously does all of the things that Nancy and Michael were speaking of. You consume less energy, you put a less of a strain on the suppliers of non-renewable as well as renewable resources, and ultimately you save money. But it also has some other ancillary benefits um, and, and problem solving abilities. Um, a lot of times these are comfort issues. People may Sure, surely want to save on energy, but they have a home or a building where there's a big separation in temperature or, or, or comfort. And by making the building more energy efficient, you usually can help balance those areas. Um, drafts, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, an area in your home or in your building where you're feeling air moving, where you don't want it to move is a big deal and makes people uncomfortable. These are signs of wasted energy resulting in high energy bills. Ice dams is another really important one. Um, the last two winters around here, we had some very severe freeze and thaw patterns with a lot of sun. So everybody knows what an icicle is, you know, the pretty formation of water dripping and refreezing, but an ice dam is very different. Uh, whether it be from a lack of insulation or solar gain or radiant heating of the, of the roof, melting the snow underneath the top layers causing water to run down and then when it gets back to that level of the of the gutter and the soffit and the fascia area it refreezes again but the problem is when water freezes it expands in every direction north south east and west and it'll get up underneath the roofs it'll expand and freeze and then when it thaws you get water coming down inside the house most likely ice dams can be solved with better insulation stop the premature heating up of the roof through attic and upper floor insulation. Every once in a while, it's got nothing to do with insulation and it becomes a solar gain scenario. And then we have some solutions for that. Um, water is one of the biggest enemies of any building or structure, resulting in building rot, mold and mildew, um, insects and rodents, uh, believe it or not, the, a lot of the same holes that we're tracking down to find out where air is moving without your permission are the same holes that rodents and insects are using. And so it's sort of a cross connection between full healthy home diagnosis with the conservation and energy efficiency in mind. And we've learned that in the field. Uh, and the burning of fossil fuels. So there is a finite amount of stuff we can dig up from the earth and light on fire. We'll run out of it eventually. Um, so all of these things are, are, are items that are helped by energy efficiency. So the drawing on the right in this picture illustrates the outline of a building's thermal boundary or of a 
thermal envelope is sometimes what we call it. So if you see the laser on the screen, this pink area sort of shows where we're defining the areas in the house or the building that are being heated and cooled or not. Um, one of, of the little simple mantras that I teach my building science students is anywhere you are in the building, you have to ask yourself, am I inside or am I outside? And whatever the answer to that question is, it should be definitive. You should really be outside if you're outside and you should really be inside when you're inside. So in this illustration, you can see some areas here that would represent a mean wall attic. This area would represent an upper wall attic. This area would represent a crawl space. Well, if you don't have good insulation up here, that means that the heat from this room is going up into this outside space and making it less outside. That's the description of that analogy, inside and outside. So comprehensive air sealing, ways to stop the air from getting where you don't want it to go. Areas like baseboards and window frames and plug gaskets and doors and through the wall and through the window air conditioning units, anywhere where there's a crack or a gap, around an opening or a building component. Uh, it, down in the basement, we concentrate on the areas where the floor joists are sitting on the concrete masonry unit, that's called the rim joist. Ceiling and wall is obvious. And then in the attic, a couple of different terms, knee wall, that would be a knee wall right there, a short wall so that you don't bump your head in, a, in an A-frame scenario. And exterior wall insulation, obviously, the outermost portions of the building's shell or, or envelope. That's just another version of that drawing. Um, this, this particular drawing is something that there are many different incarnations of it. But what it's doing is showing an illustration of the first rule of thermodynamics. So a lot of the things in this world are just based on physics. And it is a physical property that when you heat air, it tends to go up and it also tends to carry moisture. When you cool air, it tends to go down. So these arrows up here indicate positive pressure, warm air exfiltration out the top of the building. The blue arrows down here represent negative pressure, cold air infiltration or makeup air. So the air comes in the bottom, the mechanicals, the heating system, the humans and the animals heat the air up and it starts traveling up and it starts moving up and out the top and that phenomenon is called the stack effect. Um, you can see examples of that just by walking down a New York City street in the wintertime. You will see that all of the apartments on the first and second floor have the windows bolstered shut with blankets and plastic protection on them. and and all kinds of energy saving and heat retaining devices. Look up onto the top two floors and the windows are open because it's so hot up there that the stack effect is getting exacerbated by the height of the building. The pie chart shows an estimation in relation to other areas. Where's my energy going? And you can see the biggest one is air infiltration or convection, exactly what this is showing. So almost all of your energy loss comes from the stack effect, from your air leaving your building prematurely. The idea is to slow this process down. So if you can sort of wrap your head around this particular illustration, you know, it's a cross section of a four bedroom center hall colonial, maybe 2,000 square feet. There are lots of homes just like this in the Marinette areas of full basement, areas of relatively small crawl space, air conditioning with ductwork up in the attic, boiler in the basement with ductwork or a furnace going to vents to supply heat. The, the calculations on a normal house like this would be something like the entire volume of air for this house is exchanging three times an hour, meaning every 30, Every, every one third of an hour, every 20 minutes or so, all of the air is being replaced. The air comes in at the bottom, 20 minutes later it goes out the top and the cycle repeats itself. You're paying to condition that air. You're paying to heat it, cool it, dry it out, moisturize it, purify it, depending on your needs and the time of the year that it is. So what this whole idea of weatherization is based on just slowing that process down. 
keeping the air that you're investing in in your house longer than it's staying in now, but not too long. The next question when I make this explanation to people is, well, don't I have to have fresh air? I mean, I don't want to live in a plastic bag. Yes, absolutely. But you've got a long way to go, meaning three times an hour air exchange. I would like it to be once every three hours. And we have algebra, we have scientific tools, we have all kinds of math that can determine based on how many people live in the house, where the house is in the country, what the heating degree days are for that area, what should be the air exchange. And uh, unless I can be involved when the house is being built, I've almost never made a house too tight. One of the tools that we use, as I was just explaining, is a blower door. So this is a ripstop nylon frame-based fan. What you're looking at is the inside of a front door. You can see the door handle right there and the six panel wooden door. We close all of the doors and windows that lead from the inside of the house to the outside. We open all of the interior doors. We shut off all the mechanicals, whether it's a combustion, hot water heater, furnace, boiler, um, anything that is combusting oil, natural gas, or propane, we shut it down so we don't pull carbon monoxide or dioxide back into the house. Then we put this device in an aperture. In this case, it's the front door. It's a big tension ripstop nylon frame with a large electric fan. And this device right here is a small computer controlled manometer. It's basically just a pressure gauge. The hoses that you see are referencing the outside natural atmospheric pressure, the inside atmospheric pressure, and calculating the difference between the two. The fan gets turned on slowly, slowly ramping it up. And the manometer shows us once it reaches a point where the building is depressurized to negative 50 pascals. Um, pascals is a unit of measurement. It is the equivalent of about a 26 mile an hour wind hitting the building. Now, all of the areas where that building or house has air leaking out, now it's leaking in. And we can find it, we can pinpoint where the air leakage is, but most importantly, we can quantify the cubic feet of air per minute moving through that fan, and that's how we get some of our numbers needed for the algebraic equations that I was referring to, determining building airflow, natural air exchanges per hour. Another thing that's really neat about it is that um, it will reveal areas of mystery air leaks. Meaning if we're going into a building and the goal is to stop the air leakage, we don't set this up first. We go in and do all the things that we know are problematic. Electrical and plumbing penetrations under sinks, electrical outlets and switches on exterior walls, unions of trade separation, the wall meets the floor, you have the floor guy, the sheetrock guy, the trim guy, um, large egregious gaps and breaches, Seal all those up first and then put this device on because air moves via the least path of resistance. If you have two holes in a surface, a large one and a small one, all the air rushes out of the large hole till you close it and then the small hole reveals itself. So it's sort of a step-by-step -step process. Another, uh, another tool that we use to diagnose buildings energy efficiency or lack thereof is thermography. The use of infrared cameras. Uh, quite simply, they are cameras that are sensitive to temperature, not just light. So this is actually not a typical infrared image, but I like to use it because it shows a couple of very interesting things. This picture was actually taken by a company who formed a business model where they would drive around Westchester County and New York City and take pictures of your building in, at night and then send you an unsolicited diagnosis of what's going on with your building. People found that a little invasive. Some weird guy parked out in front of the camera in the middle of the night taking a picture. That's what it is. So this is a nighttime scenario. The darker the color, the colder the temperature. So deep, deep blue sky, probably 20 degrees outside. Bright, bright red, probably up to 60, 70 degrees. And white is obviously the warmest. So this is a typical home at night when it's cold outside and the heat is on. It's set, you can see a bunch of things. First of all, up in the bedrooms, it's interesting that the windows are quite blue. I mean, maybe people are sleeping in those rooms and it's cold, they don't have the heat cranked. 
Looks like someone might be up and having tea in the kitchen. You can see that there's a lot of redness there. Also, you can see the shortcomings of these windows. Usually when you line up a whole bunch of windows right next to each other, bad things happen. Leaking a bunch of heat. And obviously this house is in woeful need of additional attic insulation. All of the heat, based on all of the little illustrations that we just went through, is collecting on the underside of that roof and heating it up. Thermography or IR camera or infrared cameras. I think the first infrared camera I bought, I paid $5,000 for. That same technology now is available in a small little device you can plug into your iPhone for 300 bucks. So the technology is changing rapidly. <clears throat> this is a big time area of cold air infiltration. This is an illustration of where, I and mean, this is a photograph of an example of that illustration where you have the blue arrows of cold air coming in. So you have block here, concrete block, foundation, concrete masonry unit, CMU. You have a window, typical basic window. This would be a sill plate or top plate. This is a board going across here. This board is the rim joist, and these are the floor joists of the floor above, and that's the subfloor of the floor above. So these joists are sitting, load weight bearing down onto the concrete masonry unit. The window's then headed off so that the weight gets diverted around it. And you can see where an electrician has poked a hole. Over here, you've got a dryer vent. You've got all kinds of areas that poke the hole, people that have trades that have poked holes in here. But one of the things that's very interesting about this picture <clears throat> is the predominance of cobwebs and spider webs. Spiders build their webs where air moves. It's like setting up a sail and catching a free lunch. So Mother Nature's, I don't need an infrared camera and I don't need a blower door to tell me that there's air moving through here. Mother Nature's backing me up. Leaky ducts. So most of the time when you see metal duct work like this, tin knocked galvanized truncated metal duct work, it's literally metal that's folded over each other and then they just walk away. And over time it spreads apart, it, it cracks, it leaks. And if this is running through an unconditioned crawl space or an unconditioned basement, it's a really big deal. Again, keep the air that you're investing in where you want it to stay, not let it fly all over the place. So there's all kinds of solutions for that. Typical, unrenovated, original, sort of 1950s attic insulation. I see this in homes that are being renovated all the time. Uh, an old, degraded, crack-faced fiberglass product where the papers literally split apart from 50 years of extreme temperature. Um, and again, one of the reasons why I'm even in business and why Michael has been a champion of this whole idea is we live in climate zone five. It is extreme. It can be 100 and it can be one. There aren't many places in the world where that's the case. So we have all the battles to fight around here. Again, more of that same sort of scenario where the insulation is just collapsed and completely non-functioning anymore. This is just a couple of little tools and tricks of the trade. Um, we talked about areas where air is leaking, so nothing works better than for sealing up cracks and gaps than just good old fashioned caulk. And now we have all kinds of wonderful low VOC, no VOC, organic based um, caulk and sealant products. There's a big, big influx of that into the market. Um, the outlets and switch plates by simply inserting a foam gasket to stop the leakage there. Migrating to a digital thermostat. You walk out of the house and forget to turn the heat down. One day of doing that could practically pay for, I think that unit right now is $49 for a digital programmable thermostat. And now I'm sure all of you have seen or heard of the Nest. A couple of guys that split off from Apple and made an algorithm learning um, thermostat. That's kind of cool. Then there's other ones that literally look like a mini iPad that are flush mounted into the wall where you can program your heat and cooling. You can check your local school's website to see what's for lunch that day. You can control it from your phone or iPad from anywhere in the world. Um, redoing ductwork, re you know, new proper metal flex lines that are insulated and sealed properly. Uh, low flow shower heads, or this actually isn't a low flow shower head. This is a really cool device. What it does is, we all go to take a shower and the first thing we do is turn on the hot water and wait for the water to get hot and then start balancing it. You do that every single day, 365 days a year, you're wasting a lot of water and water that you've paid to heat. 
So what this does is it allows you to turn the hot water heater on full blast. I'm sorry, the hot water in the shower full blast, but only a trickle comes out until it senses that the water is warm enough and then it comes on. So you save a lot of wasted water. Um, LED lighting inserts, replacing overhead lights. You know, uh, an incandescent bulb is really a heat source. If you think about what an incandescent light bulb is, it's simply a gauge of wire that has so much electricity running through it that it glows with heat and then we cover it with glass. Well, you could use a tenth of the electricity by converting to a compact fluorescent light bulb, which quite simply is a gas that when excited by electricity glows. That uses a tenth of the electricity of an incandescent bulb. Or you could switch to an LED bulb, which uses a tenth of the electricity of a compact fluorescent bulb, a light emitting diode. But the longevity of the LEDs is tremendous. 20, 30, 40, 50,000 hours of life, a lot of these bulbs are rated. This is a material called Roxol, which is everything that fiberglass wishes that it was. Uh, fiberglass is a petroleum-based product made in Southeast Asia that relies on the pockets of air between the glass fibers to be the insulator. Roxol is a basilic rock-based product made in Canada, left over from the quarry industry. Nothing is more fireproof, mold resistant, insect resistant, air has a much harder time moving through it. It doesn't suffer the same shortcomings when it becomes compressed. And it has a much longer lifespan. Rodents won't live in it. A fiberglass is an excellent harbor for rodents and insects. There's all kinds of benefits. This is a little heat temperature gun. It's basically a non-contact thermometer. Um, you've probably all seen that. You shoot a laser, it tells you the exact temperature. This does the same thing, but it also casts a light on what you're looking at and determines its baseline. If you shoot it on something and then move to something colder, it glows blue. Turn it on something else, it's warmer, it glows red. Tricks and tools of our trade. Caulking, 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 like I said. I mean, just caulking that baseboard all the way around that entire house, you'll cut off a tremendous amount of unwilling air movement. Weather stripping doors. Uh, so many of the doors, especially these beautiful original doors, and I'm a big fan of those. I don't want to see a beautiful mahogany door that was installed in 1928 wind up in a landfill to be replaced with some modern metal or foam core one. We can fix the original door. We can use articulating weather stripping and door kits and sweeps and make it not leak air anymore. And this is how we would handle that area of the rim joist as I was speaking about. Spray foam sealing any areas of convective heat loss Roxel insulating any areas for conductive heat loss. You can see we've already started remediating some of the gaps and breaches in the ductwork as well. That's what it looks like when we're all done. The cobwebs are gone, spray foam is in place, a bulk of Roxel is inserted, and that rim joist now will have a much easier time fighting the infiltration of that cold air or those blue arrows. This is a bunch of different ways of sealing up the ductwork. So you see the foil tape there. This gray material is called mastic. It's sort of a semi-elastic nail polish. It, it, it gets painted on and it seals up. Um, you've all heard the jokes, the MacGyver analogies. Duct tape is great for lots of things, but not ductwork. <laughs> this is not the prettiest picture in the world. But boy, was it a difficult scenario. You've got gas lines, refrigerant lines, drain lines, soil waste lines. Everybody poked a hole in the rim joist around here. So again, it's, it's certainly not the most beautiful thing, but it is not leaking air anymore. It's all part of fighting that same, that same battle. And, you know, solving pipe freeze issues. You know, we got a lot of pipe freezes around here last, last winter. One of our other favorite products is a boric acid treated cellulose. So quite simply, it's post-consumer newspaper product that's taken out of the waste stream. It's cleaned, fiberized, chopped up, and a few additives are, are brought in. In this case, wheat starch, a totally organic material that helps it remain less dusty, less flyable. It's sort of, the wheat starch sort of clings it together and boric acid or oxidized boric acid, a magic mineral that's been around forever. Um, from the days of my early days of New York City of striping the baseboard with a white piece of boric chalk that you would buy from the bodega downstairs. Safe for humans and, and animals, but uh, deadly to insects. Certain levels of it will kill insects. So boric acid treated cellulose. In this case, the borates give the 
cellulose a class A fire rating, which people are shocked to hear. This is a fiberized, recycled newspaper. You'd think it would make great kindling. It's a class A fire rated material. It'll actually snuff a fire out. It also fends off insects, like I said, the borates. Um, keep, it, keep the insects away. And it has a lifetime warranty not to support microbial growth. Mold fighting, insect repelling, fireproof, all great products. What a wonderful thing to cap your house with as opposed to fiberglass. There's one of my guys blowing it onto an attic floor. Um, these guys work real, real hard. As you can imagine, it's not the funnest job in the world. You're usually in an attic when it's either brutally hot or freezing cold. Um, they earn their, their, their hard working pay every single day. Uh, we we uh, take it very seriously with precautions and protection and hydration and air purification and all kinds of things. Before and after. So there's that same attic. That material's been removed. All of the electrical penetrations have been sealed and 13 inches of boric acid treated cellulose has been sprayed on the floor. Giving that house, going from an R2 to an R50, 50 times the resistance of heat transfer with all of the other ancillary benefits that I just spoke of. A lot of people use their attics. Um, this is actually a beautiful house in Larchmont, small sort of tricky tight Tudor attic but the people desperately needed it for storage. They needed to be able to store some things up there. So we ripped the whole attic apart. We removed all of the insulation from underneath the areas that were gonna be floored. We dense packed it with cellulose. We laid down rigid foam board and then plywood on top of it. Then we built these little mini walls so that we could get even more insulation around the perimeters. The weakest link in the house is where the roof and wall connections are. It's a high point of vulnerability. It's also where we like to sleep. If you think about it, almost all of our bed headboards are up against an exterior wall right under where the roof comes. So if you had to leave an attic with a, 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 a chink in the armor, not, not a hole, but a small dent, it would be the middle part. And the outer sides are where you really want to concentrate. We also needed to provide a little window, a runway, so that the window was accessible. So we could open and close the window. This is the underside of a crawl space. So some crawl spaces are actually the manifestation of a home being built on stilts. The level of the floor of the crawl space is the same level as grade outside. That is the type of crawl space that you would want to exclude from the energy envelope and you would want to set the thermal boundary up here in the ceiling of the crawl space. This picture is hard to see because it's a foil faced product, but all of those little rivets are a giant plastic washered roofing ring nail holding two inch polyiso cyanurate rigid foam board up against the underside of the crawl space. The vents remain open, the crawl space is cold, and the distribution pipes are insulated with a commercial grade distribution. This in effect makes the envelope of the house smaller. The crawl space is not part of the energy envelope. The house right next door was built very differently and grade was way up here. The floor of the crawl space was five feet below the frost line. That means that that crawl space has some geothermal properties. Around here, once you get about four or five feet below the frost line, the temperature is always gonna be about 52, 53 degrees. So with that type of crawl space, you would close up the vents, you would remove all insulation from the ceiling, and you would just insulate the walls, basically making it a, a, a small basement taking advantage of the geothermal properties of the slab. In wall, exterior wall, drill, fill, and plug. This was a phenomenal project. 18, eight, nine, 1882 carriage house in Riverdale in the Bronx, converted into a fabulous resident for a very um, environmentally um, motivated and driven woman. She is a champion of all things renewable and energy efficient. So when she found me, it was the dream client. We are going to do everything we possibly can to make this, you know, 150 year old, 130 year old building as energy efficient as possible. And one of the things that it required was carefully popping off these cedar shakes, which were original, original, numbering them. So we knew which one went back, drilling holes, 
injecting the boric acid treated cellulose into the wall cavity, sealing the hole, flashing the penetration and reinserting the original shake. Um, you can't buy shakes that have that exact color, texture and curl. So it was very important. So there was a little bit of a historic preservation element. Um, this house had an amazing uh, horse and buggy turnstile. The, the, the entire ground floor was a huge, probably 20 foot diameter rotunda where you, at this point now, they pulled their Subaru in on it, and with one finger, you could push the Subaru and it would spin on the turnstile so that you could go in and out of the garage one way or another. That had big challenges to insulate underneath as well. So very, very unique, unique project in Riverdale. I'm not in the HVAC business, but I am connected to it because it has a lot to do with energy conservation. Um, basically, HVAC professionals run calculations on buildings, uh, Manual J, ResNet, all kinds of mathematical calculations to quantify BTUs of heating required and tonnage of cooling required to condition the building. Those numbers can change dramatically based on the integrity of the thermal envelope. So you could have a house and have it, on a, have it drawn out or maybe even framed out. And the HVAC guy shows up, back in the old school days, he would stand across the street and however many fingers it took for him to block out the house, well, that's how many tons of cooling he would put in there. Uh, now it's a much more precise mechanism because you certainly don't want to undersize the heating and cooling system, but you definitely don't want to oversize it either. So the HVAC professionals need to know exactly what the R values and the thermal integrity of the building is going to be so that they can recommend the right products. Ductless heat pumps, mini splits, very, very highly engineered box fan compressors outside, super engineered interior distribution with different ways of remote controls and thermostatically controlled um, controls. So you see, perhaps you've all seen one of those inside of a restaurant, inside of a commercial space. They are probably the single most energy efficient way to heat and cool a building. This is um, airborne heat pump technology. So you guys will hear, if you haven't already heard about geothermal technology, that is just what it sounds. Dig a hole in the ground and take advantage of mother nature jumpstarting the equation. Well, there's so much energy just in the air, molecules moving, anything warmer than absolute zero, molecules are moving. And these incredibly designed Japanese and Korean products have figured out a way to derive energy just from the air. No need to dig a hole in the ground. So this is airborne heat pump as opposed to geothermal, which is ground source heat pump. Um, places like Israel, where everything's made of rocks and you can't run ducts. Places like Ireland, where the temperature is very steady, never really gets warmer than 75, never really gets colder than 55. All over Ireland and lots of places in Europe, this technology is just booming. And it's starting to come more and more around here now. Um, other key energy efficient measures, things that Nancy was referring to regarding what the town and the village of Mamarina did, lighting, new ballasts and tubes, CFLs, LEDs, room sensors, just a simple scenario where you, know, you can go into a large building. For example, you take a, a school and you know when the lights are on and when they're off and you identify the highest usage light areas, you change them to the most energy efficient and you have them with automatic controls. Something like a bathroom, you walk in, the light turns on, you walk out, it shuts off. And nobody will forget to turn that switch off. Um, the savings are minimal individually, but significant incrementally. The more you do, the more you save. Appliances, so dishwashers and refrigerators and freezers, we've come a long way based on the refrigerants that we use now, like things like R410A refrigerants and based on the pumping technologies, the low, um, uh, the low electrical load using pumps and motors, all kinds of ways to save energy with a rated appliance. You could stand there in the appliance store and look at two different dishwashers that are identical. One's $300 more because it's Energy Star rated. Over the life of that appliance, you're gonna get back that $300 and then some. And oftentimes there are prescriptive utility rebates Right now, Con Edison for this area has some phenomenal prescriptive rebates, meaning you don't have to sign up for any program. You don't have to get all involved in tons of paperwork and arduous um, calculations. You simply send them your receipt for the really energy efficient dishwasher that you bought and they send you a check. 
And there is a lot of those programs right now as far as, far as the Con Edison green team and green team contractors. I am a Con Edison partner. Um, people ask me all the time, why would Con Edison give you money for buying something that uses less of their product? It's a really great question. If you think about it, Con Edison is in the very simple supply and demand business. They cannot meet demand if supply runs low. And all of the things that have happened over the last few, few years are direct examples of how there's no easy and cheap energy out there anymore. Um, it started with a movie that's in the movie theaters now about the coal miners getting trapped, coal miners dying, digging for little rocks to light on fire, to boil water, to turn steam turbines, to make electricity. Everybody remembers the Fujikora nuclear disaster. Everybody remembers the BP oil spill. These are catastrophic events that happened because we, as human beings, are trying to find other ways to make energy, get energy. Um, it's not there. So Con Edison must incentivize its ratepayers to use less of their product so they're sure to have plenty in August when the grid is being severely tapped. Water savings. So aerators, showerheads, low flow toilets. Again, there's so many ways to save water. Um, each one small individually, but the sum of the parts is, is quite significant. We talked about the Nest thermostat, programmable thermostats, power strips for TVs and computers. So one thing that I used to surprise people with, but I'm sure now you all know it, you walk out for the day and press the off button, and as you walk out of your house, just turn back around and look at your audio-visual appliances again. Look at the little red standby light on, on your flat screen TV, your cable box, or your satellite decoding box, your DVD player, your gaming system, whatever it is, it's got a standby light on. Some of those, stand I, think the, I think a 60 inch LCD or LED television in standby mode is pulling as much electricity as a 60 watt light bulb. It doesn't need to be in standoff mode. So they make smart power strips, which are labeled so when certain things shut off, they actually shut off. There's no power going to it. Now, obviously, you wouldn't want it, um, your router, for example, to be shut off. So in my particular office, when I press the off button, everything shuts down except for the outlet that my wireless modem is, and router is plugged into. So I want the house to still have Wi-Fi. But the TV, the gaming set, all that stuff is off. No, no, no um, standby light. <clears throat> More tools of the trade. So again, a lot of, um, a lot of you have a pull down attic stair, some sort of system that gets you from your living space into your house up into your attic. People forget that's a door. That's a door separating inside from outside. It's a door mounted horizontally. It's suffering from tremendous pressure differentials. It's usually at the top of a staircase. It is arguably the most important door in your whole house. And so often I see it's cracked and gapped a little or open or somebody's made some styrofoam box to try to cover it up. We've done a bunch of calculations and the truth is this appliance is the thing that gets it done best. It's called the attic tent. It's actually available on Amazon. And you install it over the staircase from the attic side, caulk it into place and through the blower door and through the infrared, we've been able to determine that it is worth its weight in gold. They're not cheap, a couple hundred bucks, but they really, really work. Again, LED lights, very important proper bathroom vent fans, proper ventilation, getting the warm moisture laden air out of the bathroom, but not just dumped into the attic, properly routed to the outside, um, or solving comfort issues. This is a 110 CFM Energy Star rated bathroom vent fan that has a heating element in it, a light, a directional light. So we've done everything we can to take the edge off that bathroom, but it's still freezing cold a couple months out of the year. We throw a little energy at it in the source of a small heating device. Um, crawl spaces, again, typical before and after. A bunch of paint stuff, garbage, junk everywhere. Totally cleaned out, redone, and encapsulated. There's actually insulation on the walls behind this. This is a fire rated clean space vapor retarder material. It's basically a 20 millimeter pool liner, and they are phenomenal. And it goes from a really disgusting place that you'd never want to be to kids will want to hang out in there when you're all done. That's the end of my slideshow presentation. Well, Chris, I got a few questions for you. I'm sure the audience does too, but they're not here to ask them. So, now, how many energy audits do you say, would you say that you've done in your, your career? Well, that's a, that's a really tough one, Michael. I would, say I, I would say I average probably three to four 
whole home diagnosis energy audits or building audits, meaning the person doesn't know what they need. They just know that they need some information. They don't have a specific problem. They just want to know what's going on in their building. I would say probably for close to 10 years, three to four a week. So it's really quite a lot. I, right, so you got a lot of experience with this. Now you notice that, that it seems that some people have a reluctance to have an energy audit done on their house. And maybe it's the word audit. Yeah. You know, like maybe we should call it assessment, but maybe you can tell them how easy it is to get an energy assessment done on their house. It's, it's really easy. You know, I've changed my philosophy over the years. I used to show up with a team and a Ghostbusters hazmat suit on and all kinds. Now I show up with myself and a clipboard and a flashlight and an ear and a mouth. I listen to my homeowner because they are an incredibly helpful diagnostic tool. They live in that building. They have a history behind it. I then come up with what the easiest stuff is. And the way that I try to translate it is I am there to give you information. You want to collect as much information from me as you can. Then when you have the time and the bandwidth, I can help you prioritize what to do with that information. Oftentimes I predicate my little speech with, please don't take offense to anything that I'm going to say because your hot water heater is a dog, you know, things like that. Like people, they get, you know, they learn, they understand, and they realize where's the best place for me to invest. A lot of times it's people that know they should do something, but have no idea where to start. So the question is, okay, I've got $2,000. Where do I put it? And, and I help them. I basically explain to them what the return on investment is, you know, where, where the quicker bang for your buck or the, the lower hanging fruit is. And oftentimes it's in the form of insulation. I mean, not every house can do solar, not every house can do geothermal, not every house needs a new heating and cooling system, but almost every house could benefit in better insulation. You know, I wish that, that every house could get a blower door test. We should actually do a show on blower door tests themselves. They're amazing. Uh, when you see one of them done, you'd be surprised at where the cold air is coming through into your, and the leaks are in your house. So uh, is it something that you would recommend a person have done or is that something you would do if you're doing a new construction or a renovation? It's absolutely one of our, it's one of our more helpful tools and it's usually sort of in a second step process. Meaning I come, there's no charge for my visit, there's no obligation, I sit, I talk, I listen, I educate, and then if we need to go to the next level, I start bringing in the more, the heavy duty diagnostic tools. Or every once in a while I'll get somebody who is well versed and educated in this and they say, hey, do you have a blower door, can you bring it? And I say, sure, it doesn't take long to set up. Um, there's a little bit of preparation that has to be done. Things like all the fireplaces have to be cleaned out. You know, you depressurize a house and you start sucking air through the chimneys, it'll blow ashes across the, uh, the room. But it doesn't, small children and animals do not get sucked into the fan. Papers don't fly all over the place. People are actually quite surprised to see how well it works. It, it does depressurize the house. And then inevitably, when I'm gone, a neighbor comes over later and knocks on the door and says, is everything okay? I saw this large apparatus in your front door and people coming in and out. Were you wondering if they're having a fumigation issue or an insect issue? And they explained to them, no, it was just a building science test. Yes, well, we'll make sure that we do get uh, Chris's information to you so that you can contact him about the things that he was talking about today. But Chris, for the audience, what is the one takeaway that you give them? What is the simplest thing that they could do now in order to save energy in their home? I would say the number one and the simplest way to save energy in a home is to, to determine exactly what it is in your home that is the smoking gun. Meaning, is it the freezing cold room that you're constantly bringing in the space heater to take care of? Is it the drafts that you always feel every morning when you're making coffee coming in from underneath the kitchen cabinets? Is it that electric bill when you get your Con Ed bill every month and you're just shocked and then you go around and see every one of your kids has a gaming device or an Apple block plugged into a wall that's not unplugged? I mean, it's usually really, really simple stuff like that. Um, it's sort of like going to the doctor and telling them what hurts most. You know, you might have a bunch of ailments, but what's the one thing that's really bothering you? And I find it's very different with every person. Um, some people uh, champion this type of thing because they truly want to leave a better planet for the next generation. Some people do it because they just simply want to save money and other people do it because their comfort level is, is upset. And if you have a comfort level, I mean, that, how can you put a price on comfort, right? So it's, it's changing something where, you know, you just did this fabulous renovation, but yet why is that area so cold? And usually there's some very simple explanation for it. And if you don't know, then I'm the one that can sort of help you figure it out. And we'll get you the information on getting in touch with Chris. And one of the great things we did in this building here is we put in LED lighting everywhere, plus the, the motion sensors, so that we're saving a ton of electricity by not using it. And someone once said to us, 
they said that the, 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 the cheapest electricity that you can ever use is the, the, or the cheapest electricity is what you don't use. Right. So, which huh. is a, a good thing to remember. Well, I'd like to thank Chris for being here today. I'd also like to thank our town supervisor, Nancy Seligson, for a tremendous presentation for introducing Chris. Now, if you have any uh, questions or comments about our series, please contact me at michael at mamarinexselfstorage.com. Uh, if you have a question about your house, if we don't know the answer, you know, I probably know somebody that does. And so we'll see you again uh, live at Mamarinex Self Storage for the next episode of Building Blocks for an Energy Efficient Home.